Okay. Yeah, okay, we're uh, recording. I'd like to call them uh, Town Services and Outreach Committee meeting of the Amherst Town Council to order at uh, 10 a.m. on March 28, 2024. And uh, we have a quorum present. Uh, four or five members of the committee are currently here, uh, along with our uh, superintendent of public works, who's going to be uh, assisting us with all of the agenda items and uh, the clerk of the council. So with that said, uh, I think that uh, I just want to note that the meeting is being conducted via remote means, members of the public uh, have access to the meeting via Zoom and by telephone. Uh, there's no in-person attendance of this meeting because it is entirely virtual, but we've made uh, efforts to make sure that the public is able to participate and um, we will be uh, reaching out to the public in a minute uh, to um, start with public comment as the first item of the day um, after we finish convening the meeting. I do need to remind everybody um, on the committee and in the uh, who are attending the meeting that this meeting is being recorded for both uh, uh, visual and audio purposes. So uh, please be aware of that notice. And with that, let me make sure that all of our committee members can hear and be heard. And I'll check also with um, our um, staff, uh, Bob Hegner. Present. And uh, Councillor Ryan. Present. And uh, Jennifer. Present. And I'm here, we're waiting to see if Hollow will be Hello, Lord, is the uh, additional member of the committee. Um, Paul, you're you're able to participate, and we can you hear us? Yes, I can. And Guilford, Guilford, boring. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, so um, with that. Uh, what we were going to do, um, I'm hoping everybody has seen the posting, uh, we'll decide on the agenda after public comment. If you are um, interested in public comment, I know that there are um, hands up already from uh, these five people, six. So I'm going to um, begin with public comment. Um, for the person on the telephone, um, I think it is, um, if you dial star nine, that raises your hand. And then we know that you would like to participate in public comment. So um, public comment can be on any matter that is, uh, relevant to the work of this um, committee and uh, the um, ask that you try and confine your comments to three minutes. Um, and with that said, uh, let me uh, Andy, uh, Councillor Lord just joined. If we could just confirm that she can hear and be heard oh. before we begin public comment, please. Okay, thank you for pointing that out. Uh, Council Lord, can you hear us? Just a mute for yes. a moment. To I look. can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, right, we no, can. Just... Thank you. Thank you. So all, all members of the committee are now present. And uh, I think that our first uh, person who um, has to be recognized is uh, Becca Watkins. Is that Watkins? So, um, Hi. Uh, would you uh, just uh, introduce yourself and uh, you don't have to give your exact address, but if you can at least uh, let us know if you're an Amherst resident and approximately where you live, 
um, that would be sufficient, but uh, please do that and then please offer your comment. Uh, yes, hi, um, I live on Heatherstone Road in Echo Hill. Um, I am doing this comment on behalf of myself and my children. I actually offered for them to stay home today to participate in this. Um, because they actually feel pretty strongly, but they were too nervous to. Um, one, I, I appreciate that uh, some time and attention is getting put into repaving our street and putting in some traffic calming measures. Um, but I am on this call today to ask if you would consider um, partaking in legislation that would allow you to reduce the speed limit to 25 miles per hour. Um, it's under sections 193 and 194 of chapter 218 of the acts of 2016, uh, which would allow you to reduce the speed limit from 30 to 25 without partaking in any traffic studies. Um, my kids have often said as we are biking or walking on the street as cars are going by that they don't understand why the town hasn't do anything, done anything to make them safer as we go around our neighborhood. Um, and I understand that it often takes a traffic study to reduce the speed limit, but it seems like this might be a good option to uh, avoid a study. Um, I do understand that this has been brought up for years and people in our very own neighborhood are part of the speeding problem but right now they legally can go 30 to 35 miles per hour. Um, Heatherstone feels like a small neighborhood road to me. So it just, it seems like a no brainer to reduce the speed limit. Um, Cause right now a lot of kids aren't even allowed to be on Heatherstone on their own um, because of the speed limit. I am so nervous that once the streets get repaved, that people will go even faster because right now all of our beautiful potholes are the only thing that that slows anyone down. Um, so while I appreciate they are getting redone, I am also very nervous for the safety of my kids. So I'm just asking that you consider um, opting into this legislation that we have in Massachusetts so that we can reduce the speed limit and keep our kids safer. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank you. Your, appreciate your comment. Um, the next person has the name of uh, just listed as Howard. So uh, please uh, let us uh, know who you are and approximately approximate address if you, um, so that we can place you. You don't have to give an exact address. Hi, my name is Howard Hanna. I'm a resident here in Echo Hill neighborhood right next to I live right next to the median on Heatherstone Road. And um, like the previous speaker, I also have um, children who uh, walk up and down the road. And we have had we have made a humble request before for the safety of our pedestrians and cyclists that uh, this neighborhood be provided with a uh, reduced um, speed limit and uh, measures for to enforce uh, traffic calming, such as keeping the median in place. Uh, we've reached out to um, the town before uh, multiple times um, with the request to uh, uh, keep the median strip in place as we know that to be an effective means of slowing traffic. I live right at the end of the median strip, so I watch uh, daily as traffic as cars driving slow down as they're entering that median strip and are going slow as they exit that median. Um, uh, in past um, emails to uh, the town about this, the about reg keeping the median strip to slow traffic, the response has been uh, that the town believes traffic slows in that in the median stretch because of the condition of the road with all those potholes. However, uh, I've responded before that the US DOT Federal Highway Administration supports the use of medians to slow traffic. Uh, the Federal Highway Administration uh, uses middle medians to slow traffic, parts traffic, provides safety for pedestrians, and provides decoration. Um, 
it provides safety and value to our neighborhood. Likewise, the mass DOT speed management guidelines propose using medians to physically slow traffic by narrowing roadways. Um, the median's decorative gardening acts as a visual cue to drivers that the roadway changes from a pass-through like Pelham Road to a neighborhood like uh, Heatherstone Road. Uh, per USDOT Federal Highway Engineering Standards, roadways are used to, uh, to slow traffic um, and reduce pedestrian fatality and serious injury. Uh, in addition, um, the current sidewalk plan only covers half the length of the road um, as opposed to the full length of the road. Uh, it does not attend to speed control and it was not a part of a, any original request regarding repaving the road. Only repaving was requested. Regardless, Heatherstone has ample width in the roadway alone to provide space for pedestrians and cyclists without the need of a half length sidewalk. Furthermore, it's unclear why three roundabouts would be used as a pilot, as a pilot for speed control when we've asked repeatedly for speed reduction and uh, to keep the, the one speed control that we have, which is that median. So from a layman's perspective, um, I just seem to have several questions about this. Uh, we just need the road repaved. We need the speed reduced and we'd like to keep the median in place because we know that to be an effective speed control. Thank you for your time. I hope you reconsider. Okay, thank you. Um, the next person is uh, Patricia Applebaum. And again, uh, same request, please let us know approximately where you live and uh, introduce yourself and uh, proceed with your comment. Thank you, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Okay, my name is Patricia Applebaum. I live on Auburnwood Road, uh, not near the intersection with mm -hmm. Heatherstone. I am speaking here for myself only. And I recognize my neighbor's concerns about traffic speed. Um, I am primarily concerned about the proposed roundabouts. The um, memo that we're considering today indicates that many roundabouts would typically have a diameter of 50 to 90 feet. 50 feet might possibly fit within the existing intersections, but anything larger would not, would require expansion. The roundabouts will also need to accommodate sp sidewalks. This plan, as far as I can see, therefore adds a good deal of paving to the existing landscape. Echo Hill was designed to retain as much as possible of the natural landscape, and that feature is what some of us like best about living here. Moreover, more paving is yet another contribution to climate change, granted a relatively small one, but at this point, everything counts. So I object to expanding the area of paving in this way. The design also seems odd. What's proposed is three roundabouts within a relatively short stretch and then along an open stretch of road with no obstructions. I'm told that nothing new will be built on that long stretch until it's repaved, but the current design does not look like effective speed control. Now some questions. First and most important, what will be the effects of installing roundabouts with respect to land takings, encroachment on individual properties, and required infrastructure such as foundations and retaining walls, especially at the intersection with Auburnwood and further along Heatherstone Road, where the land slopes on both sides of Heatherstone. Second question, are the roundabouts intended to be permanent? The memo does refer to permanent changes, but one of the attached documents described temporary pop-up roundabouts. Some of my neighbors are under the impression that the roundabouts will be removed if the pilot project shows they're not effective. Please clarify this. Third, why a roundabout? Why not speed bumps? We have been told many times that speed bumps are very expensive to install, but I would guess that a roundabout is even more expensive. 
And finally, what is the rationale for installing three roundabouts within a short distance? Would one roundabout work just as well? Um, finally, as pilot projects, how will they be evaluated? What will happen if the roundabouts are not found to be effective? Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate your comments. Um, the next person, I guess, is Myra Ross. Uh, and uh, Myra, I don't know if you're speaking. On Do you hear me? Yes. Uh, I'm, uh, okay. Are you, are you speaking on behalf of DAAC or your sitting? No. Okay. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of myself because the topic that I'm going to discuss hasn't yet been discussed by DAAC, of which I'm the chair for those who don't know. DAAC is disability, um, oh my God. Disability Access Advisory. <laughs> disability Committee. Access Advisory Committee. Okay. Um, we will meet next in April and we will discuss this, but I've become aware that you are doing some work on Route 9 uh, by the intersection with Southeast Street um, pertaining to sidewalk installation and pertaining to changing, um, you know, using the, that, that project to create bicycle and sidewalks and bus stops. Um, and I, to tell you the truth, think this is a fabulous idea. We need sidewalks. Uh, I guess they don't want them in Echo Hill, but we need them in many places in town to keep pedestrians safe, especially now that there are so many cyclists and e-cyclists. As a blind person, I can tell you that cyclists are often very problematic. Met quite frequently, they don't follow the rules of the road. People on e-bikes particularly um, are Right, you know, frankly, quite frightening to a lot of blind people because they are on sidewalks and they go incredibly fast. So there have been standards that have been developed. I don't know specifically what they are, but I know that there are people who are working very hard to keep pedestrians safe, to keep cyclists safe, and to make sure that the traffic doesn't go fast, but that it can actually get through. So there are all kinds of questions about building intersections. Where do you put the pedestrian pathways? Where do you put the cycle pathways? Where do you put the bus stops? Um, and, and how does all that integrate so that pedestrians, particularly people with visual impairments or frankly, people who are quite elderly and don't walk very quickly or for other reasons don't walk very quickly can be safe. I don't know the answer, but I know that it's a quite complex question and just going in there and, you know, saying, oh, this will be a bike lane. Oh, yeah, well, you know, people will share the sidewalk. Oh, well, we'll have people go out into the middle of the street to get onto the bus, um, which is done in a lot of places, is not the way to do it. It has to be thought about very carefully and people who know about how to work these things out so that everybody's safe need to be consulted by the town. Um, that's not the current practice of the town when they build things like this. So I, I would, I would urge people to talk to people. Um, we're going to talk to people on Mass Office of Disability, and I'm sure there are other people that have made a life study of trying to make sure that people are safe and they walk around. Um, so that's what I would really like you to do. I don't know the specifics. I don't know how far along you are. Um, and the other thing um, is that Route 9, this we have discussed at the DAAC, the Route 9 project that was done on, um, oh, excuse me, on um, uh, Northampton Road is um, has some problems with the way that the curb cuts were put in. And they are not um, conforming all the time to the way that it should be done to make sure that people can go off the sidewalks um, safely. Those um, corners with the truncated domes need to be perpendicular. They need to not angle off at the corners. So I think it's very important that this next one be done right. I think the town will be hearing a little more about the other one. 
Anyway, I'm so I'm sorry. I'm a little distracted by this telephone call that I can't get rid of. Um, but uh, it's very important for the town to do it right. And I'm thrilled that you are working on sidewalks. And I hope that you put a lot more money into more sidewalks because that's the safest way for people to walk around. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Myra. Uh, next person that I think is uh, named. Pippa C. Uh, so again, requested to uh, give us at least an approximate idea of where you live. You don't have to give an exact address and please offer your comment. Can you, uh, can you, Pippa, can you hear me? Can you, uh, you, you, can you hear me? Ah, uh, yes, thank sorry you. Sorry about I that. Can. I'm so sorry. Um, so my name is Pippa Comfort. I have been a resident on Heatherstone Road in Echo Hill for 16 years and raised my um, children here. And I have been concerned about safety on the street um, for my 16 years here. Um, I am in full support of a speed limit reduction to 25. I am also in support of the proposed plan that Mr. Bachelman shared with our neighborhood that includes repaving sidewalks and these three temporary or pilot roundabouts. I trust that the professionals have done their homework and that the roundabouts would fit in the space. While uh, the median is a beautiful um, addition to our neighborhood, when I am walking that strip of the road, I have to step up into the woods to avoid um, the risk of being hit by passing cars, which I have to do at several points along Heatherstone Road, um, literally stepping into people's yards or into the bushes as, as cars pass. Um, it feels very unsafe to me. The section that has not been addressed is, is up where I live, where Heatherstone meets Stony Hill. It is a throughway for people traveling to places like Hampshire Athletic Club. And um, that section is also um, perilous. I live on a blind curve and I am I'm nervous coming out of my driveway, which I know many people have faced that situation. But if there are measures that we can take to address that end of Heatherstone <clears throat> as well, I realize that this project is kind of a once in a lifetime and I don't wanna see it done halfway at the same time i do not want to see debate holding up something being done we have been working on this as a neighborhood for years and years and years and have approached the town many times in writing and on the phone and through email we have um, taken measures into our own hands by devising signs our children made signs years ago please slow down this is a topic that has been um, on the table for a very long time. And I'm thrilled to see the proposal that's on the table and I am in full support of it. And again, I trust the professionals have done their homework about what type of temporary roundabout will fit or, or, or not. Um, and I thank you so much for your time and considering this. Well, thank you very much for your comment and for joining our meeting. Um, so I think the next is uh, Elizabeth Lingo. Same request. Uh, let us know approximately where you live. Don't have to be an exact address and please offer your comment. Thank you so much for offering this space for comments. Um, I live on Heatherstone Road right in the middle. And I, um, I've, I've lived here for 11 years and uh, have also raised my children who are now in high school and um, sophomore in college. So their entire time of being free children with bikes and walking to friend's house, which was the um, kind of the goal of moving to this neighborhood has been treacherous. And like Pippa, I have been working literally for the last uh, 10 years with the town to advance the key goal of pedestrian safety for children, for um, a, the many seniors who still live here who are walking around in walkers, 
who are trying to navigate now getting out of there. And also teens who are trying to get out of their driveways on Nether Stone. Um, and I just wanna say, first of all, I love this plan because it's about pedestrian safety. That is the main goal. Um, I have, I just wanna honor, I walked the streets of Heather Stone with E. Vogel. <laughs> I just wanna honor her incredible work that she did around the transportation and pedestrian safety. Um, and working with Guilford over the years, everyone has been shocked that Heather Stone does not have sidewalks. It was actually created as a neighborhood. It was one of the first neighborhoods before the idea of like that sidewalks had to be included. Um, and that is why we don't have sidewalks. Every other neighborhood that has been developed has sidewalks. And yet it's designed where people are going, you know, 45 miles an hour, literally, we've clocked it on um, working with the police to clock people on Heather Stone. People go fast. Um, so the sidewalks idea has long, long, and is a best practice around pedestrian safety. So I'm delighted that it's actually getting implemented. Um, of course, um, as several people have echoed, the we all want sidewalks to go all along Heather Stone so that it, there's a safe way for our children to walk to Fort River, regardless of where you live on Heatherstone. If where Pippa lives on that far side and on the corner, there are multiple families now who have moved in with small children. There is no way for them to go to Fort River, walk to their school without being on Heatherstone. And it's true with the potholes, with people you know speeding, there's literally kids have to jump out of the way to get avoid being splashed, avoid getting hit. People are on their cell phones now. So I just want to honor that stretch of Heatherstone needs some attention. That corner of where Auburn Woods, Stony Hill, and Heatherstone come together is another ripe spot. We all feel for having another, um, another little mini roundabout, um, if not one somewhere along the long stretch of Heatherstone to try to slow traffic. Um, I've been in conversation with Eve and with um, Guilford about this for a long time, and we've talked about, you know, medians are fine. I know my cop, my fellow neighbor loves the median for, you know, speed reduction, but speed reduction is not the only goal here. It's pedestrian safety. And I just want to emphasize that there's no safe pedestrian way with that median. As Pippa noted, you're jumping off, um, even now as an, you know, as a, fully with an adult and my dogs. I mean, we have to jump into people's yards and into the bushes when cars are coming through there because there's nowhere to walk. It's more narrow than anywhere else in Heatherstone. Um, I also just want to know in all the conversations, it's a multi-pronged solution. So absolutely what Becca Watkins pointed out about the opportunity to reduce the speed to 25 without a traffic study. Yes, that has to be a priority and making that happen. That's an easy win for our neighborhood and for the town. Um, sidewalks, please, I encourage you to put them all along Heatherstone as soon as you can. Um, I know <laughs> Paul and members of our neighborhood have complained about the, the level of potholes on the side that's being improved. <laughs> it's kind of like epic. Um, but there's equal, I mean, the corner that Pippa lives on around when you come right onto Heatherstone, that blind curve, there are so many potholes there that literally people careen around because they don't see the potholes yet. And then to avoid them, they literally go on the side of the road so that people, it's not safe for other side of the road. So it's, you know, there's been multiple times where people are literally in the other lane because the potholes are so bad there. So that I feel like just pushing um, Heather Stone up for like further redoing and adding sidewalks is key. Um, I just wanna note, there has been discussion about speed bumps. There is a unique aspect of Echo Hill that I just wanna put out there that um, Echo Hill is built on a stone shelf, a granite shelf. And so speed bumps actually create excessive um, vibration and sound for everybody who lives on Echo Hill. So I would just say speed bumps are not a viable option for the people who live here on Heatherstone. That's why Guilford was trying to experiment with this idea of the mini roundabouts to see if that's a way to do that traffic calming to stop the straightaways. So I, um, I'm kind of in favor of experimenting with this pilot and see how it works with the roundabouts. Um, do I have anything else? Hey. I, want to I think that's it. So thank you so okay. much. And thank I really you. appreciate everyone's efforts around this. Okay, thank you for sharing. Uh, Ms. Axelson-Berry. 
Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, I, uh, Kitty Axelson Berry, I live on 89 Stony Hill Road, um, which is in Echo Hill South, but I walk through Echo Hill North, which is where Heatherstone is quite frequently um, to get mostly to get out to uh, either the bus or to um, Amethyst Brook. And, and Andy, um, please stop me when my three minutes are up. Please feel free to do that, okay? Because I know okay. that's needed. Um, so I think that um, this idea of roundabouts and also sidewalks are really creating new problems rather than fixing actual problems. Um, the road currently is very nice and white, except in the area of the median, which is beautiful. And even though the pre previous speaker says she always has to like get go onto people's property, I never have to. And I don't know whether that's just a difference in perception or I don't know what. Um, but I walk there and sometimes we can walk two people, three people abreast, I mean, always. Um, and it's really very beautiful. People with wheelchairs have easy access to the streets, which they wouldn't have otherwise. Kids on bikes have access to the streets, which they wouldn't have if they had sidewalks. Um, sidewalks narrow the road. And if they're not beautifully maintained, and as we know, the town has a lot of problems keeping up with maintenance of sidewalks, as well as roads. If a sidewalk is not well maintained, it's really impassable. So I don't know what people are talking about when they love sidewalks so much. Um, I've been on the board, by the way, of Echo Hill South Association for more than 10 years. And every now and then this question comes up, usually with people who are just moving here saying, oh, we should have sidewalks, we should have sidewalks. But then after a while, they come to love the beauty of being able to like talk to somebody um, on a nice, nice wide area that isn't limited to a sidewalk. I would go along with um, painting, painting, um, you know, a strip along the road. I think we should keep the maintenance, um, the, the, the median. We should not have sidewalks. The um, idea of having rotary is, seems pretty ludicrous to me to go to all that expense. And then, I mean, I just, I just can't understand why we would do that. Um, and I think I have said all that I need to say. So thank you very much. Just to repeat, maintenance is the important thing along Gatehouse Road. Also, it's a really bad maintenance problem. Thank you. Yeah. No, thank you, Kitty. Um, next person is A C is uh, identified, but please uh, tell us who you are and approximately where you live uh, and based off your comment. Okay, great. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Great, thanks. Hi, this is Christopher Budnick. I live on uh, Aubinwood Road with my wife, Anjali, and our two kids that are two and four. Um, you know, I've come to think of the potholes as a safety measure because <laughs> otherwise cars just go so fast in the areas that there aren't potholes. And I want to like say it's horrible to have to think of them that way, that there are not other traffic calming measures. So my heart is warmed <laughs> that y'all are taking up this uh, this consideration. I know people have been working on this for a while. We've only lived here for three years, but I can't take my kids on Heatherstone. Uh, we have a stroller and there's no room, especially where that median is when cars come. Like we're launching into people's properties. <laughs> um, we're getting covered in snow and sleet. It's 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 terrible. We can't walk to the farm. We, we, we can't do a lot of things that we should be able to do in the neighborhood because of the median and because of how fast cars go. So I want to echo uh, the suggestions of other people who spoke before, remove the median, please. It's terrible. Hate it. <laughs> it makes life dangerous for us. Add sidewalks if you can. Yes, love that. Um, pave if these other things are done. Sounds great. Uh, traffic calming measures like the mini roundabouts as an experiment. Totally in favor. Thank you so much. Um, I think the, the important thing for us is that uh, th that this is an opportunity to have something happen. And if the speed limit can be taken down to 25 um, as quickly as possible, that would be great. And I really encourage you guys to look look at other temporary measures, like putting in something that would show people the speed they're going, uh, putting in, a, I, I don't know a lot about the vibrations and how that works, but if there are like dampening speed bumps that can be put in, would be very much in favor of that too. We, we can't ride our bikes, we can't walk, 
on a beautiful road and we don't get to see all of our neighbors on Heatherstone. So uh, thank you for taking this up and thank you for the chance to speak today. Okay, well, thank you for joining us. Uh, next, I think, is uh, Helen um, Sternheim. Yes. So please identify yourself and give us an approximately where you live. Okay. I live at 72 Heatherstone. I'm probably one of the older members of this neighborhood. I've lived here for almost 59 years since this house was built, when Bill Orban built the area. My daughter, who lives with me, and I don't see any need for sidewalks. We live in front of, the median is in front of our house. Uh, I agree that it may be a little dangerous to walk there, but I certainly I slow down for people when I see them there. The rest of Heatherstone Road and we do not need sidewalks. Many roundabouts seem like overkill. Uh, I don't know about speed bumps. Now, all these people with young children claim that they and their young children are out walking. Certainly on weekends, I may see a few of them. Most of these children are overbooked with activities and are not around the neighborhood. I barely see them. I do occasionally see them on weekends. And certainly, we re one of the reasons we moved to this neighborhood was the trees and the country feel of the neighborhood. And sidewalks certainly would eliminate that country feel to the neighborhood, which is what many of us moved here for. So. Yes, I would like to see how the stone road paved. It has not been paved at all, except for pothole repairs, which don't last in the 59 years I've lived here. But I don't see any need for sidewalks, and I certainly don't see, see any need for roundabouts, which will mean construction will last on the roundabouts for a year, because I've never seen a roundabout built in less than a year around here. And they certainly seem like overkill. So thank you. I'm not in favor. I'm in favor of paving. I'm not in favor of sidewalks. And I'm not in favor of roundabouts. Thank you. I appreciate your comments. Uh, Michael, I see that you're with us. So same request as for bed from others. Uh, let us know approximately where you live and uh, offer your comment. Uh, thank you for this hearing. Um, uh, I, I'm in Echo Hill, and I live on Oak Knoll. It's um, right off of uh, Heatherstone, and I've lived here for over 30 years. And um, I just want to, I'll be brief, I want to support the comments of a number of the speakers. Uh, number one, it would be really wonderful if you could reduce the speed limit to 25. That would be the, the uh, well, aside from paving, that would be the most wonderful thing you could do. The paving is uh, what slows people down at the, where the median strips are right now uh, because there's so many potholes that uh, um, people, uh, cars have to slow down. I'm a, um, a senior. I'm a lifelong runner, a bicyclist, and I walk a big dog. I will say as a matter of uh, safety that when I go through that median section, um, I need to step into the wooded area off of the roads to be sure that my dog and I are safe. Um, I disagree with those who believe it's safe as it is. Um, uh, and the easiest solution would be to put sidewalks in, but um, and I, I also think sidewalks could be done in a way that enhances or supports the uh, the forested atmosphere of our neighborhood. Uh, but it's kind of a I scratch my head about how the sidewalks will end at uh, the uh, at, at the near Albanwood uh, intersection. It'd be great if they went all the way through. Uh, um, and it, it would be great to have speed bumps if you could do that. Um, the idea of three mini roundabouts, it seems awfully busy, awfully construction oriented, awfully uh, taking away from the natural beauty of our neighborhood. So. I'm in favor of other uh, calming measures than, than many roundabouts, but um, we need to do something. And I would listen to the parents of children in this neighborhood, especially on that street, 
um, because there are times when you see children run into the street. Yesterday, I saw a child run into the street after a soccer ball. Uh, luckily, there were no cars. But if there was a car and there was a car speeding, that child might have been in danger. So I, I ask you to think about those issues as you go through this process. And I thank you very much for your service. That's it. And thank you for your comment. Um, Lisa Martinez, I believe, is uh, next. Uh, so, Lisa? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you so much. Um, uh, and thanks for the hearing. I was alerted to it by my neighbor. Um, we live on Alpine Drive. I live at the corner of Alpine and Heatherstone at 17 Alpine. Uh, so just in the middle of the medians and at the beginning of that straightaway. Um, <clears throat> I apologize, I missed the beginning of the hearing. And so I uh, will educate myself about the placement of these proposed roundabouts, um, but that is my primary concern. I, I like the big roundabouts in town. I think they've been really helpful, but the small roundabouts on a residential street seem uh, pretty intrusive and, um, and disruptive as others have mentioned. Um, I raised my son um, at my house and uh, I 100% agree that sidewalks will be an improvement on Heatherstone Road. Um, paving will be an improvement, but that'll speed traffic. But the median is not pedestrian friendly. It's aesthetic, but it's not pedestrian friendly. So take that space, put it on the side of the road. Um, you know, as the previous speaker said, there are ways to make them beautiful without heavily taxing town resources, plant some trees, and um, and you'll have a walking space. You'll have a navigable road that's pavable, easily pavable um, and maintainable. So I think that that's what I would hope to see. Um, and again, I, I have driven the stretch from, you know, from Main Street, Pelham Road, all the way down to the hack. Um, the dangerous parts are not the straightaway in my mind. Um, because you can see clearly, I mean, in terms of driving, a driver can see far down the road where on the end where I live, the dangerous parts are where we curve. And so if we're doing sidewalks, you know, where I get nervous driving and where I slow myself down is as I hit those curves down past Avonwood, down towards Stony Hill. So if it's possible to, to extend the sidewalks um, in that direction, then that would be great. I hope I've uh, not been too confusing and I appreciate your time, thanks. Thank you. Um, I think the next person is Jason. Uh, Jason Dorney. Jason, uh, welcome. Please let us know approximately where you live, uh, and uh, please offer your comment. Thank you. Thanks for the hearing. Thank you for allowing us to speak. I live on Hickory Lane in Echo Hill South, right near the intersection of Heatherstone, Albanwood, and Stony Hill. And I would just like to echo a lot of the comments that have already been made, um, but I would like to state that reducing the speed limit would be great, but that doesn't do anything unless there's any kind of enforcement of the speed limit. Um, people drive pretty fast in this neighborhood from, you know, Pelham Road coming down Heatherstone to Stony Hill to the Hack. Um, especially coming down Stony Hill. I know we're talking about <laughs> Heatherstone now, but Stony Hill, that that hill, um, those two hills coming down to Gatehouse Road, people, people speed down those hills pretty frequently. We are a young family. We have two young kids. We have friends that live over off of Heatherstone Road in, in um, Echo Hill North, and we do not like walking to anybody's houses over there. We won't let our kids walk on that street or ride their bikes on that street. It is dangerous. And the median, I do not believe does anything to help. As other speakers have already said, it seems to be the potholes that are the thing that slow people down in that area and not the median. I am completely in favor of the roundabouts. I think that they are a great traffic calming solution and I would also like to say that narrowing the lanes would also help. If you're going to pave the roads, I think it would be beneficial to also stripe them with narrower lanes. That is just a visual deterrent to speeding. 
And I, I would also like to uh, bring up the notion or the idea of instead of speed bumps, using things like speed tables that can be found in front of Amherst College's cafeteria there on nine. Um, I think that those are a good alternative to a traditional speed bump. They do cause people to slow down, but they don't they don't require them to go as slow as they might if there was a speed bump. I am concerned with people speeding on the streets after they're paved. Um, right now, people drive fast on the parts of the streets that are that are paved well or you know not full of potholes. So that is a concern of mine. Um, I, I think a lot of people cut from Pelham Road over to uh, Belchertown Road or go to the gym using those streets. We have a lot of rentals in the neighborhood, um, either fortunately or unfortunately, depending on who you talk to. And there's a lot of people coming to and from classes on the weekends. There's people speeding at night. I walk my dogs at night generally. Um, and even with a headlamp and a collar lit up on my dog, I still feel like people fly past me in cars and give me barely the requisite amount of space as they drive past me fast at nighttime when it's hard to see. I will agree that the curves are areas where it is hard to see people walking, uh, especially at night. The neighborhoods are not particularly well lit, so if somebody is walking at night without any kind of flashlight or any kind of um, light to let people know that they're there, it can be hard to see them. Even in that area where the median is, you're coming off of uh, off of Pelham Road, and there could be people there, and it's really hard to see because it's not well lit. So those are my concerns. I do think sidewalks would probably be one of the better things to do. I think you can put sidewalks in and it will in no way ruin the aesthetic of the neighborhood. Um, a sidewalk is similar to a street. I don't think the streets ruin the aesthetic of the neighborhood. We have lots of trails. We have lots of woods. Um, and I don't think you need to put sidewalks on both sides of the street. You can put one a sidewalk in on one side of the street and that would be a good solution. So those are my comments. I appreciate you all listening and taking the time to get some feedback and thank everybody for joining the call. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I think the last person we have is uh, Mary Claire Griffin. And, hi. Uh, hi, welcome. Thank you. Um, so I live at 270 Alpine. Thank you for giving us this opportunity per to provide feedback. Um, unfortunately, I do want to start my comments with just a little bit of a complaint that that I understand the constraints around timing these meetings. Um, but the timing of this meeting um, just makes it really hard for people who have full time jobs to attend. Um, I fortunately am faculty and have a flexible schedule and I'm not teaching at this time. Um, but the parents of young children are disproportionately working people and it is unfortunate that it's harder for them to be here. Okay, um, otherwise I just wanted to say as a child, of a, as a parent of a two-year-old, um, I, you know, she can hardly walk now, but I would not feel safe as she gets older um, with her walking on Heatherstone. Um, I just unequivocally favor sidewalks. I don't care if the median stays or not, I just want a sidewalk. Um, and if having a sidewalk requires the median go, I think the median should go. Um, I felt even strongly, uh, even more strongly about this yesterday. I was driving home and even on Alpine um, where cars go slower, I almost hit someone because we don't have sidewalks and they were walking after dark in all black. This is not the first time this has happened. If there were a sidewalk, that wouldn't happen. Um, I also unequivocally uh, favor a lower speed limit, but I also wanna echo what someone else said about how a speed limit will not ensure that people go slower. Um, so a 25 mile an hour speed limit on Heatherstone would be amazing. Um, but between the fact that there's tons of delivery vehicles now, um, that's something that's really different than it may have been when people originally moved here 20 or 30 years ago. Um, they're unwieldy, they drive fast, and they don't abide by the speed limit necessarily. I also know that, you know, even 
you know, homeowning individuals such as my husband, who is not on this call, do not abide by the speed limit, even when they think they do. So I don't think a lower speed limit is enough. Um, and I really enthusiastically favor the mini roundabouts. I think they're fantastic. I lived in Seattle um, and they had a lot of mini roundabouts in those neighborhoods and they were very effective. They also offered a nice place to have trees and plantings um, and just actually really enhanced the cozy feel of a neighborhood. Um, so that's all I have to say. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, and that's all. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. And I think we had one more person who's asked to be recognized. Uh, and uh, it's Anna, is it Annalisa? Uh, you can. It's Annalise Kittrell. Hi. And I, we are at 218 Heatherstone on the corner of Pebble Ridge and Heatherstone. And I apologize, but um, as Meg just announce it is very difficult to me get onto a meeting at this time and it, it's really unfortunate because so many parents that live on Her Heatherstone have small children and would probably echo so much of what has already been said you know I I'm currently <laughs> in the middle of um, some responsibilities and pulled over in my car just to make sure that you know this is heard, but I, I certainly am in favor of these roundabouts. If something <laughs> slows it down, I'm also in favor of a slower speed limit. Um, and on Heatherstone in our driveway, we have a steep driveway. So naturally anything from chalk, a ball or <laughs> anything that our children are playing with, if they're playing in the front yard at all, are gonna naturally go towards the street. I personally, as an adult, have been almost hit just checking my mailbox. We come around the corner, people are speeding through, not, you know, looking at their phones or whatever. And re really, it's actually been a laughable joke that nothing's, you know, the speed limit has been an issue for years and years and years. My husband grew up in this house and he said that, that it was an issue, you know, 30 and 40 years ago, but nothing's been done. And it's, it's shocking in a neighborhood that is full of children and young families and people that like to run and walk and participate outside that nothing's been done up until this point. So I certainly support anything that slows it down, but as many others have said, a speed limit just doesn't do anything unless we're going to enforce it. Thank you. Appreciate it. We have one more person who's now asked to be recognized, and I hope that uh, we can get on to having the committee hear from Guilford, but I we will uh, have uh, um, no. point of order. Um, Andy, this the person who's raised their hand had had already spoken today. Oh, so okay. Just just a note, if it's up to you, if you'd like to call on them. Yeah. Again. No. Um, I think that uh, under that circumstance, thank you for pointing that out. Uh, I appreciate it. And uh, Mr. Nunn, thank you very much for uh, being present. Uh, but I think we do need to get on to letting uh, the town manager and uh, Mr. Mooring uh, uh, state their, uh, what, what their recommendations are and how they have reached the uh, uh, recommendation that they presented through the town council to the committee. Paul, do you want to start or do you want to have Guilford start? Andy, did Guilford. you want to begin with, with Heatherstone Road? Yes. Uh, out of order, so out of order of the agenda item. So I just wanted to clarify that. Yes, we will start with Heatherstone Road because of the large uh, number of people. I was, uh, I thank you for mentioning that. My thought had been that we would uh, uh, respond uh, if there was a large number of people on a single item, that we would uh, try and get to that item first. But we do have um, an extensive agenda, so we're not going to be able to <clears throat> complete the discussion on Heatherstone today. But it's fresh on everybody's mind because we've heard from all of the um, people who've 
offered public comment on the subject. So, uh, Jack, again, Paul, do you want to start? Yeah, to, to expedite things, I just go straight to Guilford. Andy, thank you. Okay, Guilford. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so I, I you, you've pretty much, if we're going to start with Heatherstone, you've pretty much heard everything we've, we're have we proposing to do. Um, take out the median, add a sidewalk. The reason the sidewalk stops at Albanwood Drive is, is that's where our paving project stops. We'd be happy to continue it on, but we're just keeping it within the paving project, all the improvements we're doing now. Um, we, we've, um, we did look at raised um, speed humps. Um, as a traffic calming measure in this route in this area, but we typically don't like to use them on a main road that serves um, transit and serves um, serves transit and serves the emergency response vehicles. Um, on College Street, there's a road parallel to Main Street's parallel to College Street, and it allows the emergency vehicles that we need to to go down Main Street and go around the speed the race speed hump. Sorry. Right there, raised crosswalks there. Got it. Um, so that allows that to happen. Um, there's also no uh, transit buses that go down um, College Street. Uh, UMass has a different view on raised, raised crosswalks, speed humps. They put them everywhere. Um, and yes, they. if you put them everywhere and put them very close together, you can slow traffic and have effect on traffic. Um, but so we don't really like to put speed humps where we have um, transit and the, the primary response route for emergency vehicles. So that's why they weren't chosen here. So we chose the mini roundabout. It's a horizontal deflection versus a vertical deflection. Makes you have to slow down and go right and then back left as you go around them. Um, that is That does have some traffic calming ability. It's uh, We use those on College Street not College Street, South Pleasant Street by the college. Um, we have those there where you have the splitter islands in the middle of the road that make you diverge out and diverge back in. Um, we did not leave the median in place because one, the, the median really wasn't constructed very well to begin with. Uh, if we want to put the median back, we need to do a lot of work putting it back in. We also believe we can be better to have narrower lanes and a sidewalk on the side of the road to get people to visually see that there are pedestrians and to slow the traffic down. I'm happy to paint a yellow line down the road if they want to do that. Um, the yellow lines sometimes uh, painting does make people have a visual of it's smaller, but then again, we actually have studies that say people, when you're on a painted road, you tend to drive faster because you think you're on a more urban uh, collector than on a rural or a side road where you should be driving slower. Um, so this is the project. So Heatherstone, this is before you. Um, that's kind of what we come up with. If you want us to take a pause and have a public hearing with uh, more people and let them talk and have a more say in what's going on and have more discussion with them, uh, we have time to do that. Um, so we don't have to approve it today. Gil Gilford, a question that came up. Um, are, is there, are there any land takings that are required for any of this paving project? At this time, there's not. When we start moving into, uh, when we start moving further into the road and trying to connect with Gatehouse, there will be some, probably mm -hmm. some takings along that route. But for the project before the council, there are no land takings. There's no new land takings. There may be a issue we have to clean up at the corner with Pelham Road, which looks like we popped the road on top of somebody's property when it was first built. <laughs> um, but we've got this most of the sidewalks, and we think most, even with the roundabouts, many roundabouts were off everybody's everybody's property except for property. There's actually probably one maybe at Alpine that we might have to take a little corner of property, but it looks like they all fit. Good, thank you. One question I had that I want to turn it over to the committee to ask questions. Um, are the, uh, 
I don't think we have any neighborhoods where neighborhood streets have roundabouts right now. The roundabouts are on larger roadways. Um, is that correct? We have been slow to put many roundabouts into the neighborhoods because we haven't found good places to try them and had time to try them. We have the smallest roundabout we have is actually on Snell Street University. That little one there, that is the smallest one we have. What we propose for this neighborhood would actually be smaller than that. Do you know of any uh, neighborhood communities that have one that people could look at either from the neighborhood or from the committee? Um, I would have to look. In the western part of the state, I'm not sure of many. There's several in the eastern part of the state. Yeah. So. Look, it looks like Andy froze. So I'm going to call on George Ryan. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Gilfrey, one question that was raised was if these mini run, which I like the idea of the mini runabouts. I like the idea of traffic calming. I like the idea of taking steps to actually try and get people to slow down. I certainly agree that if we could lower the speed limit, that would be great. Um, but I think it's also true that that by itself doesn't really often accomplish much. So some kind of traffic calming measures are really valuable. And so I, I like this idea, um, but the question was raised, uh, I think, during public comment. Uh, are they easy to remove if you find that for some reason these aren't working? Um, uh, is this a big, big problem? No, it do, it should be very easy to take out if we decide not to do it or not to keep it. Okay. Thank you. Jennifer? Can I just jump in there for, for a second, Andy? So just yeah. to clarify, while the request is permanent changes to the public way, what Guilford is proposing is a pilot program for these mini roundabouts where it, they can be removed and there's no, because it because they are built there to be temporary and see how they work. So. Jennifer uh, Tab. Thank you. So I have, uh, I guess, a couple questions, a few questions. Um, so if it's a pilot, do we know how long? Is there a time? You'll be evaluating it over a certain period of time? We would like to do it over a year. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you. And the sidewalks, could they, you had said that the sidewalks were going as long for the portion of the road, <clears throat> excuse me, that was being repaved. Um, I mean, I know that <clears throat> there were comments, some residents favor sidewalks, some don't, but there were several that seem to want, um, requested the sidewalks go all the way down. I think, is it to Stony Hill? If, um, to Gatehouse, is that probably. possible? Yeah. It would be another, it would re require another, pro I mean, we'd have to design it and put it together. We haven't done that yet. So that would be like a phase two? It would be a I mean, phase two. Be part of this. Um, so if slowing the speed limit is something we can do under the chapter that was cited of state law, um, could, couldn't, I mean, what would it take to do that? Because it couldn't hurt. So though, I, you know, I believe the chapter they quoted is the old default speed limit rule. Um, there actually are newer changes that were, we've been given um, that allows us to do it in a different way. Um, and that's probably the way we should do it if we want to look at it. We've been looking at this in um, the Cushman neighborhood and we have the report back on that. So I would actually propose waiting and doing it after we find out if we can, after we see, we, we do the Cushman one and see if we can do it there, that would give us a better guidance on how we can do it. I believe what they're quoting in the 2016 rule is the de facto speed limit, which actually makes it harder for the police to write a ticket you can lower the speed limit, but the police have restrictions on how they can enforce. Hmm. But I'm not sure. I think that I thought that was a little older in 2016. So what you're suggesting is the lower the speed limit at, at Cushman neighbor area and see how effective that is, and then look at imposing that, you know, making that change on Heatherstone? No, no, just going through that process and seeing how the process oh. works. And okay, then we can okay. use the same process on, on this one, I believe. And how would we, would this committee sort of 
put that on our calendar to revisit that? I mean, how, how do we, or would the neighbors kind of I think make it's a on note? There. I think it's been brought to the attention. It'll probably be once we once Cushman goes through. I believe we'll get a lot of people requesting to do speed zones and uh, so forth in neighborhoods. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bob Hector. Yeah, I also I, I support the reduced speed limit. I think that would help. And I think uh, sidewalks will help as well. Um, I do think we should look into phase two as quickly as possible. I recognize, you know, there's limits on the resources that everyone has, but um, it seems like we shouldn't just do one end of a, of a thoroughfare uh, when there's going to be obvious um, improvements there, but not improvements uh, further down the street. Um, I think it would be helpful to get to phase two as soon as we can. Um, I, um, I agree that reducing speed limits doesn't help much, but uh, we should maybe talk to the police department about um, enforcing the speed limits as they are. Um, and uh, putting the, those signs up that you're speeding and slow down, um, which uh, do actually calm traffic. I have seen that in my neighborhood. So if that, that seems like if we could install that for some period of time, that would help. That's it. That's the Lord. Um, thank you. Um I'm really excited about this pilot program and moving towards permanent and getting a lot of information as to how it might impact um, other neighborhoods. And I know you said it wouldn't be a big issue here, but I'm not sure I'm familiar with land take or taking land. Um, is that taking, you know, buying it from residents? Is that using? Could um, somebody please explain to me what that means or entails? Paula Gilford. So most of the time when we take land in Amherst, uh, it's a very small piece of land and it's, its value is, is very, very small. Um, so what we usually end up is we end up negotiating with the property owner to donate the land as either an easement, which means they still own the land and we have the right to use it, or we do a fee taking where we outright take the land and it becomes town, part of the town layout. And usually there's a, some type of compensation that comes in and because it's usually such a small piece of property, it's usually a small piece of compensation. Thank you. Jennifer? Yeah, more curiosity. Um, if they donate the land, do they get a tax deduction or is there any? Their lot, gets, gets, to the town? Their lot gets smaller, so it's less to tax. <laughs> But it's a small, Thanks. small. Okay. Um, so I guess what we need to do as a committee is, is um, identify for this particular proposal whether uh, we need additional information and um, so that we can give a list to um, Paul and Guilford about what information the committee wishes to have or do we feel that we have enough information that we can uh, proceed uh bob well i i think we we certainly have enough information to proceed but i would like to provide the the the, the people living there with uh, a a more robust chance to provide public comment. So if we could have a public hearing in the evening when people are more available, I think that could help uh, just to broaden the perspectives that we we've seen. But I mean, I can I can I'm prepared to vote now if we if we if if that makes sense. Um, Jennifer. Actually, I think George's hand went up first and come back to me. George, mm -hmm. um, definitely public hearing probably would would be appropriate um, given the level of interest. Um, you might also mention to folks who are still listening 
that they can also just send us written comments. Mm -hmm. um, that can be a way you can deal with uh, the difficulty of meeting times. But I think customarily, uh, I've not been on this committee for a while, but um, we customarily, I would think, do public hearings for these sorts of uh, requests. And we've got a bunch of them uh, on our plate at the moment. Um, so I would think that, that this would be um, a natural thing to do. Um, the other is perhaps more controversial, but again, uh, when I was on the committee in the past, we would reach out to TS uh, to uh, TAC, and we'd also reach out to uh, DAAC. Um, we would like their input. Um, we would notify them. They'd look at the, the materials we've been given, and uh, they would offer us a, a written comment. So I would also think that it would be appropriate for us to reach out to them. Good points. <laughs> Jennifer, did you have anything else you're going to? No, I just wanted to support. I Well, I support what George just um, suggested and having a public hearing because, you know, I would want also everyone in the audience to know that we heard you. Um, it's I'm always torn, you know, as a council member when when people offer, you know, very almost diametrically opposed public comment. And I don't live on this, you know, in that neighborhood to know. So I don't want people to feel that they haven't been heard. So I think having a a public comment um, or, or having a hearing where more people could participate. But um, I'm always torn when I hear, you know, some people say, we want sidewalks, we don't want sidewalks. It's a hard call. Yeah, our policy, I believe, does not require a public hearing. Athena? That's exactly what I was going to say, that the town council policy on um, control and regulation of the public ways doesn't require hearing on permanent changes to the public way. Um, and there are, we've we've deliberately tried not to, if, if a committee wants to hold an additional listening session, we've, we've tried not to call it a public hearing to avoid confusion with the public hearings that are required by the charter. So I would advise if the committee wants to go that route, not to call it a public hearing, but to call it a listening session. So, um, you know, it was an uh, interesting group of comments that I appreciated all that we heard from, but I was in total agreement. Uh, and I think that in the end, uh, it's no substitute to making a decision. Is everybody on the committee familiar with that um, neighborhood? Have you driven Heatherstown to Stony Hill Gatehouse to understand the connection? I, I, I've sure. driven it. It's been a while since I've gone that way. So uh, I'm, I plan to go that way and pay more attention to the issues that have been raised. Um, but I, I certainly know the potholes are there. <laughs> I drove by when it was on the council agenda a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. So I've um, driven it and walked it. So uh, is there anything else that anybody would like to offer? And because uh, then I think we have to reach a conclusion as to uh, whether we want to do a listening session, as we, which is the title suggested, and uh, what other information, and contact DAAC and TAC to see if they have any comments, which probably is true of the other um, street proposals that we have before us, that we should uh, not just limit it to this one, but Councilor Lord. Is it um, bound together? Like, can the paving be moved forward ahead of the mini roundabouts or are they kind of a package deal? Yeah, Guilford, and uh, when were you thinking that you need a decision and when were you thinking that you were gonna do the work? It, it's a package deal. We don't wanna have the contractor move in and then move out and have to come back in and work over stuff he's already worked on. But this road is probably at the end of the list of roads we're going to pave this year, um, or the first group of roads we're going to pave is at the end of that list. There's a little cul-de-sac in this neighborhood that gets paved that we have to replace a water line on before we pave it this year. So um, 
we have a couple months to think about it and discuss it. This this project we do. Okay. Well. Yeah. So I think if the council, if the TSO committee is going to vote to uh, request the opinions of the DAAC and the intact that you are explicit about what you are requesting them to opine on um, in terms of the areas of expertise, and then also provide a deadline so you have time to reconsider it and then make a recommendation to the full council and in time for Guilford to be able to do the paving under this contract that we already have in place. Uh, yeah, so I think that what would be helpful um, if you can do it today, that'd be great. If you can't do it today, that um, you could send a memo to the committee too about what are the dates for each of the projects that are listed. Um, what are the ones that need decisions from the committee the soonest? And uh, what is, do you have any approximate schedules on any of them? Belchtown Road is the only one we need a decision on rather quickly. Okay, that's helpful to know because maybe we should take that up as our second item then. Uh, so is there is it a committee consensus? I don't uh, if somebody wants to make a motion, they're always welcome to, but committee consensus is, is that uh, we're going to uh, try and um, let DAC and TAC know, and if there are specific questions, as was uh, mentioned by Paul, uh, are there specific issues that we're looking for input on? I think what TAC has done a lot of good work, and uh, I know George, you've worked with uh, our, uh, TAC also, on things like uh, speed limits and traffic calming devices and what's effective. Because I, I think that was where a lot of this was coming down is this, uh, uh, where, where we were getting disagreements is that there was uncertainty about whether uh, just on their own uh, traffic uh, speed limit reduction will work because unless you have enforcement and we just have a limited capacity of our police department and uh, being on a residential street, it's going to be a big ask on a regular basis. Councilor Ryan? So, um, echoing Paul, I think we want to be very specific about what we're asking um, of these two committees. Uh, I think we should ask them. I get the feeling there is a consensus that we should, but perhaps we need a motion. But we should be very specific. Um, we should also give them a, a fairly strict time limit, um, you know, two weeks or, you know, whatever, something, um, so we can get it back in, 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 in good time. I personally have found it very helpful uh, when TAC has weighed in. I realize it takes more time. It's another layer. Um, but I find that they often bring a level of, of understanding and knowledge, especially with bike safety, pedestrian safety. Um, also, they might have some thoughts on the mini, uh, mini roundabouts that might be interesting for us to hear. So we should be very specific. We're asking them about this specific project, and I take it these four specific or five specific changes and, um, and give them a time limit. And if they get back to us in time, great. If they don't, then we, we, we move ahead. Okay. Um, is there any objection to uh, turning to the Belchertown Road uh, or that question because that was the one that it seemed in, when we asked what was most needed? Athena? I think for members of the audience, it would be helpful if the committee indicated that you're planning on holding a public listening session and when you might take this up again. Um, I think the next step would be to uh, see if we can get any, uh, give a short turnaround input from DAAC, Disability Access Advisory Committee, 
and from uh, TAC, the Transportation Advisory Committee, to see if and then uh, have that input available before we do the listening session. And uh, so Councilor Ryan's uh, recommendation that we uh, give a very specific time limit, I think really needs to be built around the listening session. And uh, when- The committee is meeting next on April 11 and April 25. So did you want to include um, a, a request for opinions from the Transportation Advisory Committee and Disability Access Advisory Committee by the 11th or the 25th, and then move forward with scheduling a listening session? Probably have to do it the 25th only because uh, we have to give respect to the committees that they would need to have time to organize their own meetings and schedule their own meetings that, at a time that work for their members. Um, um, so just to clarify what I'm including here is that the members agreed to request opinions from the Disability Access Advisory Committee and the Transportation Advisory Committee on bike, pedestrian, and um, disabled resident safety for the proposed project by April 25. And then the committee will move forward with scheduling a listening session. Is that accurate? Yes, and I Thank think you. we could uh, go ahead and uh, look for a date for the for a listening session. If we want to try and do that in the evening, we have to um, poll the committee to find what's an available date that all members of the committee would be available. So there's a series of steps there. I think that the first one is that um, <clears throat> maybe I'll work with the... Uh, Vice Chair of the Committee, uh, Councilor Ryan, and uh, we will um, draft a uh, request and circulate it to the committee just as uh, it will be a public document because it will be circulated to the committee. But uh, what we propose to ask and see if there are any comments and uh, get that request off to those committees as quickly as we can. And um, sorry, one more thing. The, the committee will look for a listening session time that will be um, easier for working people to attend in the evening. Is that correct? I think so. I mean, should, uh, unless there's disagreement, uh, they should raise hands and let me know, but I think that's probably what would be helpful to, uh, as was suggested by several commenters today. Thank you. And then for members in the audience, um, if and when the committee schedules a listening session, it'll be posted on the board of committee calendar on the town website. Thank you. Okay, uh, Paul? I just want to note that the DAAC is meeting on April 9th, so we can alert them that this will be coming their way if they're able to add it to their agenda or not. As a, We'll leave it up to the chair. Okay. Um, Jennifer? No, and when does TAC meet next? Could... I don't know if they have a posted meeting yet. Okay. They usually meet once a month, I believe. Gilford, do you know in TAC, does TAC have a meeting that you're aware of? Mm, TAC's next meeting is on the 4th of April. Okay, that's... So we'll try and uh, ask Ryan. So yeah, you can uh, just also just share the material with them. Um, and hopefully they could take it up at their next meeting, but certainly at the following one, um, just send them the uh, the files that we have. I assume you would, but that just did seem simplifies things. So they have to go hunt and find them. So I think that what we're at what we want to do is we can send that we can let them know about all of the things that have been referred to the committee, but emphasize that the ones that we are giving priority to are Belchertown Road and Heatherstone Road uh, at this time because they Belchertown Road is the one that we have been alerted 
needs a prompt decision. And I'm going to turn to Guilford to make a presentation on that. And uh, then um, in Heatherstone, we want to do it because we want to try and get a uh, public um, listening session scheduled. So, Guilford, um, why don't you, uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, more about Belchertown Road and then see if there are questions? We do have the <clears throat> information that was provided, of course, to the council. Athena, do you want to ring, uh, pull up the page with this shows the uh, map? Sure, we'll do that. One second, please. Thank you. So, so we've. Been, I'll just go ahead and start. We've been working on Belchtown Road for many years on a plan to uh, improve the road. The plan, because we were approaching this as being uh, funded by the state uh, transportation improvement plan, we actually had to add bike lanes to this. So we've been working on it as a bike lane project with the upgraded sidewalks all along. Um, so what happened is while we were discussing this, the <clears throat> we applied for a mass works grant for sidewalk improvements from what the properties the town purchased, which are the ones, um, can I move the cursor or can only you, Athena? I think I can. Could you highlight the three properties the town bought? They're the ones just across from Belch Town. Yes, yeah. yeah, so the town bought these three properties and they're going to be developed into affordable housing. <clears throat> so we applied for a mass works grant and then we got a $750,000 grant from the state to actually do the sidewalks from this area back towards the intersection with uh, Southeast Street. So mm -hmm. that's why this project has moved has been kind of broken out from the old, the entire Belchtown Road project. So the project is is to add the bike lane or the changes that are that are there now is add the bike lanes and then we're putting a crosswalk in at the driveway to Colonial Village, which will cross over to the properties the town bought to allow this new development to access the bus stops on both sides of the road. Um, Colonial Village actually has a bus stop inside the development, so they don't need this, but this will allow the people on the north side of Belchtown Road to cross over after they get off the bus coming home and have a crosswalk there. So the two changes are uh, adding bike lanes the entire length from the driveway of Colonial Village back to College Street and to add the crosswalk at Colonial Village dri driveway. That's, that's the two changes that require approval. And could you tell us uh, what the sidewalk situation is currently, just to give us a context? There, there are existing sidewalks there. They are in disrepair, they need some maintenance. Um, so this will, just re uh, this will actually push them back and make new sidewalks we're making new sidewalks and then put the bike lane in. The bike lane would be on the road or on the sidewalk? On the road. Okay. So, Councilor Ryan. Gilford, could you say something about the time constraints? You had said that this is something that's more pressing. Um, again, we, we, ha we have yeah. a Mass Works grant now. So, the Mass Works grant. Um, has to we have to kind of finish this this year that's why it's more pressing okay i raise that only because um again our normal procedure is at least i, I assume is our normal procedure is to get the advice again of uh, tac and daac um and to uh, consider having some kind of uh, public meeting listening session whatever um a point has been made that this is not not required, um, at least the listening session part. Um, so that's something we have to make a decision about. Um, these are fairly specific, and I wouldn't say small, but you know, very specific changes related to a larger project that's ongoing. Um, so that might be a factor for us in thinking about 
whether a listening session is required or not. But I would think um, normally we'd reach out to uh, TAC and to DAC. Um, and is there time for that, I guess, is the question from your perspective. Just time. As long as we are, as long as we are, I mean, yes, there's time to do it. We 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 would definitely have committed to doing bike lanes. So mm -hmm. you can call them bike lanes. You can call them shoulders. Uh, if you mm -hmm. call them bike lanes, they fall in. They fall in your um, the town council's guidance document for changes to the public way. If you call mm -hmm. it a shoulder, it doesn't really fall in the <laughs> guidance in the town way. But the crosswalk clearly, if we're adding a crosswalk, we clearly have to get permission. Is what the guidance says. And so I guess the issue for us, if I may speak, yeah. is, is, is is whether um, the crosswalk by itself merits that level of of input. And I, I don't I don't know what the rest of my colleagues think, but I, that would be the question. Yeah, um, uh, of course, timing is a question, too, because uh, the other thing I'm going to point out real quickly and then uh, know that uh, Bob Hegner's here. I'll call him in just a second. Uh, TAC from um, the work that I did with them as liaison during the last year. And um, uh, is they are very concerned and very attentive to what they refer to because it has, uh, there's um, pieces that go with it. It's called Safe Routes to Schools. And it's about being conscious of what is a safe walking route to a school when they're in walking distance, uh, given the number of children who may live in Colonial Village, who we anticipate living in the um, housing that were built, we want to see built on the land that the town acquired on Belcher Town Road. Um, and uh, possible other residences that may have uh, children. I think that it is worth getting tax view also on the safe routes to school question. Uh, Bob? Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, I, I'm very familiar with this road. I drive it every day. Um, and it is very dangerous in this area. I, I think I mentioned that in a finance committee meeting. Um, a year or two ago. Um, I think one question I have, Guilford, are you planning to make the pavement wider uh, so to accommodate the, the bike lanes? Yes, the okay. pavement the pavement does have to get wider. And then so so then the sidewalks would then be pushed further back. Is that correct? We'll be going all the way back to the property line, which we don't do now. Okay. Because um, I know that uh, further down the street, us, you, you're going to run into some uh, fire hydrants um, that are right next, right next to the, the existing sidewalks. And not, I don't think you'll, you're going to hit any here. But um, I think it's a great idea. Um, I think the crosswalk is a great idea. I've been very concerned about the development uh, of this area, uh, particularly the the um, the property that we we plan to develop for uh, low income housing. Uh, because it's, as I say, it's it's in, and I think Myra Ross's comments are are we should take into account. It's a very dangerous place. I've walked it. It's very dangerous for right now for pedestrians. It's uh, I biked it. It's very dangerous for bikers, um, and uh, it's. I think this would be a, a very a vast improvement. I think if you know children walking from Colonial Village to Fort River. Um, I think that um, they could cross safely. If they could cross safely at the crosswalk. It would uh, then make it give them a broader sidewalk to walk on. Um, it's not great to walk through there, but it's better than nothing. Um, and um, I, I really think it's a, a great improvement. Thank you. Paul? Yeah. I I just want to uh, cre give credit to Guilford and the DPW and the conservation and development team for getting this significant grant to do this work. I mean, it, as Bob said, it combines, you know, a heavily populated uh, low and moderate income area, new development by the town for affordable housing, 
uh, our community gardens across the street and the new construction of Fort River for Safe Routes to School. You, you've hit on all the sort of key things why a couple of years ago the town staff had prioritized that to seek grants, a grant for this area. So, uh, but credit to the town staff for conceptualizing it and then getting it so, you know, getting it up an application that was seen as being valuable by the state. $750,000 is a significant amount of money. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think that where we're at is that uh, we want to give our friends at TAC and DAC opportunity to offer comments. Um, I think that the one thing that we did hear from Myra already is uh, concern about um, sidewalks and uh, mixing sidewalks and bicycles and I think she mentioned e-bikes, if I recall. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, Guilford, if you've had any thoughts about that, but she said there. Uh, Myra said, uh, Ms. Ross said an awful lot of things. Um, we have to re we have to abide by the rules that are promulgated by the state and the federal government for ADA, and we follow those rules. The issues she was bringing up on Northampton Road or state issues, we did not do that project. Yeah, and no, I'm thinking more about how to fix this particular section that we're dealing with now. We we pretty I mean we follow all the rules we're required to follow in doing this section. Um, so we're looking at all that. Um, and the proposal is that we put in our the rec rectangular rapid rectangular flash and beacons the RRFBs um, for enhanced visibility because of the speeds on the road. Um, but we do look at all that, even though she doesn't think we do, or the commit uh, maybe the DACC doesn't think we do. Um, but that is part of what we do. So, uh, George. Councilor Ryan. Uh, just a timing issue, uh, maybe premature here. Um, it sounds like we're going to send this to, as we did with Heatherstone Road, this will go in that packet with a request that it uh, they act on it as, as, as quickly as they possibly can. Um, do we want to have a, uh, maybe, we, are we ready to think about whether we want a listening session for this? Maybe, maybe that's something we can decide later. Um, my actual reason for raising my hand is that we did hope to get to our, the RFI this morning, uh, waste hauler. That's something that I think some people are interested in hearing about. And it's now uh, 1141. I was aware of that. And uh, I'm not sure what that I can do about that or you can do about that. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, just in terms of timing, um, I would encourage the committee to conduct its work so you can get a recommendation back to the town council by May 6th, um, if that's at all possible for all four of these projects, I think that's doable um, given the time frame. But um, th that's the next council meeting after the eighth, and I, you can't, you're not going to have the time to get it by the eighth, April eighth. But you could get it by May sixth if that's. And I think that's there's with this one in particular. There's some time urgency to spend the grant. Mm -hmm. Well, we we, I just want to clarify what you what you were just saying, Paul. Is that because we had talked about identifying the highest priorities, uh, you know, picked on two of the projects for highest priorities, and now it seems like you're encouraging all of them to be just those two. Okay. Um, Athena. Um, Paul, to clarify, the council meetings in May are May 6 and 20. Did, are you asking the committee for a recommendation to the council for council action on the 6th or the 20th? May 6th. Thank you. Yeah, for uh, particularly for Belcher Town Road, I assume that that's essential. And uh, as far as uh, if we're going to have a listening session, it may be hard to make it for the 6th, but it didn't sound like that was as essential for um, the date as the Belcher Town Road is. I'm just saying that just to, to give you an opportunity to disagree. Um, 
So I guess what I would like to do, we have um, some other road projects, but uh, I think we do want to have a little bit of time to talk about the R the RFI and uh, also um, recognize that we have what are the Pomeroy uh, Lane proposal and the roundabout. Uh, is there any with the with the uh, the work on the roundabout that would be on uh, Amity Street uh, at University Drive? Is there a timeline on that? So, so actually, I can quickly do the next two if you want to. Um, Amity Street roundabout is is the first time we're bringing it forward. There is a proposal that's going forward for a grant possibly later this, this spring and summer. So there's no funding design or no funding for this around about this time. So this is this can be discussed and talked about in great in a great in a lot more detail, greater detail. Um, but this is the concept that is being proposed by um, the town and UMass. UMass and the town both worked on this one. The other project on West Street is the installation of two crosswalks and some splitter islands and a bike lane there as well. Um, and that project is, if we get around to it, we'll get around to it at the end of the construction season, which is October or November. And if it gets moved to next year, it would be fine if it gets moved to next year. But I'm sure the residents in that area would like us to move faster. Everybody wants to go faster, including of the course. drivers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, the RFI, uh, I thought the, uh, has everybody had a chance to uh, read it, I assume? Yeah. Uh, so maybe I just open it up for see if there are questions. Uh, Bob. Yeah, I just had a question about what is organics? Is that like yard waste or leafs or what? what is organics? It's the compostables is what compostables. it really is. Um, okay. It could be it could be uh, added to some communities actually put your compost and your yard waste together. Um, it's basically the same thing. So it's kind of got in the title of organics. Um, so we, we asked, yes, we asked about that. So. Well, nobody has it, so <laughs> it's kind of moot at this point. But. Some people do yard waste, but they don't do the food waste with it. Right. Okay. There are some communities in eastern Massachusetts we know from zero waste hammers that are doing it, though. But just that these companies are, at least in their response, are saying that they don't. Correct. The, the three companies that responded said they don't currently do it. One company says they have a pilot program going on, but they didn't say whether they would expand it. Yeah. May I ask Jeff. a question relative to that? Uh, Jennifer. I'm sorry. Oh, you can go ahead, George, if you want. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, it's just relevant to that. I, I was a customer of USA Waste and they did provide compostables uh, and I paid for it. It's like $60 a month. Now, maybe they've stopped that program, but um, at least in my experience, uh, what this says is not true. Um, they did have a compostables and uh, I paid for it. And then I finally decided to use the transfer station. And that was in the last probably year to year and a half at the most, probably last year. So maybe they stopped it or maybe they're not telling us the truth. I, I think that's the pilot program they were talking about. Ah, and that they've decided they're not going to pursue it. Um, I, I think they still offer it if you're willing to pay that. Pay for it. Okay, right. Thank you. Right. Sorry, Jennifer. Jennifer? No, that's fine. I was also... Um... I'm sorry, when I'm mute. So will, can one or more of the companies, will they provide curb, if we want the curbside compost pickup every every responder said they would provide it if we asked for it okay but they wouldn't there's no comparable pricing um to know what that is so the so pricing 
I'm so sorry. the pricing we've kind of put together is just for trash pickup and recycling pickup. So that's sort of a ballpark of what it, the, that would be. So the compost, we wouldn't know what that price would be until the, if we issued an RFP and the responses came back. Correct. We're, we're kind of in a chicken and an egg situation. We, we'd like to know how much it's going to cost us, but we can't really find out how much it's going to truly know how much it's going to cost us until we do the RFP. We only have this little, we have a range because it's not all the services we're going to ask for are there. Um, we also, in reviewing contracts with other communities, found out that um, there's a wide range in services the vendors provide as far as managing the program. Most of the communities seem to manage the program themselves. Um, so there's a cost to the community for doing that, which is not found by looking just at the hauler's contract. So that means that the other communities, do, would they still be considered contracting it out or would it be considered doing it themselves? They contract out the service of collection, but they manage the contract and the customer's in-house. And do we have a sense of what, if Amherst were to consider that, uh, what kind of staffing? I mean, would you have, I, I'm assuming additional staff would have to be retained. We is would that, have to. I mean, what, what kind of people power is that? I think now that's a, that's a question. If we're going to keep moving forward, we need to kind of push forward the question of what are other what does other communities do and how they they pricing it. Okay, so if we wanted to do research with other communities, is that something? It's easy like to TSO do. TSO members could do, or would staff do that? Or, or no, we we can, we can how would we can get that information very easily. We definitely need more information. Full stream, if you could elaborate on that, that the cup you're saying that the three respondents are moving to single stream. Uh, the the three the three companies are moving to um, automated collection, and when you look at the contracts they have, um, automated collection, everybody who has automated collection right now for their um, for their recyclables it's a single stream system it's not a dual stream the dual stream communities have um not they don't they have the totes like we have not the bins that are automatically picked up okay. so every vendor said pretty much if they come into amherst they want to do everything automated so that probably means we're going to have to go to a single stream recycling program and we'll have to have uh, toters for just about everything. The large roll-off bins with the wheels. Well, that's what I have. I mean, isn't that what everyone has with USA? If you if you if you're with yeah. USA, you have that now. But if you're gonna yeah. do comp if you're gonna do compostables, then you are organics. You may have a third one to go for the compostables or organics. That that would be part of the new contract to have the compostables would go in that That's same right. toter That's kind how of I toter. Would see okay. it going, yes. Is it your understanding that the trucks that are doing the automatic pickup would not have the capacity to take on a third pickup at the same time? It, it depends on how they bought their trucks, but most of the trucks that are dual capacity are actually manual trucks that are not automated trucks. So when the USA is coming through, they're actually coming through twice. And if you have compostables, a weekly compostable pickup or organics pickup, that'll be the third truck weekly. Unless you do, unless we say it's organics every other week and recycling every other week, then you can cut it down to, but I'm not sure that would work for us. Because... Why do you say that? We we some of our some of our customers generate a lot of waste. If you just see the waste bins outside, if you went every other week, you may not. It would be a lot of waste that would be on the curb every other week. The rental properties next to our house they fill their recycling tub every week. Every week it's full, so you couldn't you'd have a hard time telling them they have to wait every other week to get your recyclables picked up. 
Yeah, yeah, space. I was just curious because South Hadley, I think, is every other week. It is. Jennifer? Are we cycling? Sorry. Okay. No, I mean, our recyclables are picked up every other week by you by USA. My USA contract was every week they took both. Wow. Well, no, we do yeah. trash is every week and recycling is every other week that we have. Maybe that's just our con. Oh. It must be different contracts they have for different people right now. But our neighbors next door, it's every they get the same thing every week. And I got the same when I had him, I got the same every week. Are they doing something different in Hadley than in Amherst? Well, the, the two our two neighbors next door here are in Amherst, the two rental properties next door, they are every week. Does anybody else have every other week for recycle? U USA USA didn't provide a lot of really in-depth detail of how they do their things, and they didn't provide um so that was something else we had to work around. Uh, Councilor Ryan? Can I ask about, what I've heard is that pay as you throw is sort of the ideal, sort of the, the gold standard. And what you say in your uh, report is that this move would make pay as you throw possible only through the size and number of carts. So, if I understand that, and I probably don't, um, if you're going to an automated system, um, you know, you can't have bags that people are going to jump out of the truck and pick up. It's got to be in a tote. It's got to be in some kind of container. And um, so I guess the question is, uh, will this work? You seem to suggest that it could work. I, I need, I, I'm obviously new to some of this, so I'm, 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 I'm scrambling a bit, but um, I'd like to retain pay as you throw if that were possible, but um, is it possible? And uh, yeah, it's, I think it's going to be, yeah, I, my personal opinion is that it's going to be hard to do, do, do bags, to sell bags and you buy a bag and you put it in the trash and that's how you do pay as you throw. Um, uh, working with Susan Wade, she thinks you can still do it. Um, South Hadley is about to venture into the realm of doing bags selling bags and putting it into the cart for automatic delivery. So there's a community ahead of us trying to do it. Um, I, I really think once it goes in that tote, there's not going to be a person who's going to get out and look in the tote. The person sitting in a truck is actually going to drive up, grab the tote, dump it. He won't be able to see very well what he's dumping. And then he's going to drive away after he sets the tote down. So it, it, it could work. Is it really going to work? It may just be that the you know, if you want to pay as you throw, you get a 32 gallon. If you have a small amount, you get a 65 gallon. If you have a medium amount and you get the 92 gallon totes, if you have a lot. And then if you need to have two of them, you have two of them. And that's that's kind of how I'm thinking that the two vendors are going to want to set up pay as you throw. Although South Hadley, like I said, is going to try it. Thing. Uh, anything else, uh, Councilor Ryan, or can I go? No, no, go ahead. Go uh, ahead. Yeah, I, I, I just want to point out that I have a, an issue with compostables. Not that I don't want to do it, but there's certain times of year when it gets to be warm, I can't do it because ants get in the house and ants get in the garage where I leave it. I don't put it outside because we've got, you know, bears and other critters running around. Uh, so uh, it's I, it's great in the winter, but I can't do it in the summer. Um, and so if I'm forced to do it, I think it'll be, uh, I think a lot of people will have some problems with it just because, you know, you, you when you have ants, it means you got to deal with the ants. And it's not always easy to deal with the ants in the house or in the garage even when they come in. So um which means you might have to leave it outside, which means then once the bears figure out how to do it, uh, it's game over. So how to open them up, it's game over. So anyway, I I, I support the idea, but I can't, I, I don't know how it's going to work in the warm weather uh, when, when, you know, ants and other critters are running around. Uh, 
It's a good point. And uh, one that I think that we can talk to is zero waste hammers to see if they have any information that would help to answer that question. Uh, Jennifer? Yeah, I'm just thinking back to the MMA uh, seminar, you know, session. And like Long Meadow, they, I have to find it. They sent me their contract. But, <clears throat> but the person speaking, the panelist from Long Meadow said, I'm sorry, that it, that the pay as you throw had absolutely resulted in they had achieved waste reduction, that there was a, they thought, very sizable reduction in waste with the pay as you throw. And I, other of the municipalities that spoke or were on the panel said the same thing. So I'm just trying to think of the next steps. I mean, I do think Zero Waste Amherst has, they've done some extensive surveys. We'd want to invite a couple of representatives to come meet with the committee of, of what, where does the committee kind of go from here? I know we can't have subcommittees because then that would be subject to open meeting law, but how we um, get more information and some of our questions answered. What, what could be the next steps this committee would do? I don't know if it's maybe inviting Susan Waite to come with some a representative from Zero Waste Amherst to have you know some of our questions answered and how to you know further evaluate. So if, if I so could ask question. Jennifer, if I could ask you just one question. They said they reduced trash, but do they have actual numbers because we don't have numbers of what we produce for trash we just the numbers we report to dep are the numbers from the transfer station we do not report numbers from the private haulers so how do they truly know they reduced is always my question i ask them um yeah, I mean, I don't know what I can go, I, I can't answer that for Longmeadow um, because they do contract out, Paul might remember, do they do handle trash collection themselves? Because if they do it themselves, then they probably would know. Wouldn't, wouldn't they then keep track of how much trash has been? If they did they themselves, they would know, after. yes. So I think that, I think that they, it's an in-house service, but they, have a pay as you throw fee structure. I, I can, I can do a little more research on that. Yeah. But they, they, they felt pretty confident in making that statement. So I'm thinking that's how I think. I'm thinking they do it themselves. So I've been trying to get the meeting to uh, get the minutes done and. Uh, get us adjourned as quickly as possible. Councilor Ryan, do you have anything else to add at this point? Of course I do. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry. I know it's it's afternoon and uh, you can tell me, Andy, to stop and I don't mind. Um, but again, in my experience, speaking personally, I do pay as you throw. And I know from my own experience that I've reduced my waste by an enormous amount. Uh, here at Guilford, we uh, can find, we'll go to Long Meadow, we'll, we'll reach out to Zero Waste Amherst. We do need some data. Um, we need to know that what, what's behind this. But speaking from personal experience, because the kind of composting that 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 these outfits do is not just organics. Um, it's it's soiled paper. It's it's just about, you know, I basically, almost everything that I don't put into recycling um, goes into my compost. Um, and then there's there's the trash, basically plastic. And so I use like one town of Amherst blue bag a month, and that's for about five adults. Um, so there, it is, you know, that's my, you know, that's anecdotal, personal, what it's worth. We need some numbers, um, but that's the argument behind the compostables. I hear Bob's concern. Um, what I do is I just bought myself a, a you know a modest container with a strong lid and I put a brick on top of it and it lives outside. But I realize in the summer it can get a little smelly, um, and you have to secure it. Um, and we do have bears in our neighborhood too. The Bob probably has more than we do, um, but it's it's a small I think it's a small price to pay because in my experience you can reduce your uh, waste output enormously. Um, anyway, that's my two cents, and it's afternoon. Um, uh, Jennifer, anything else? Uh, I'll... No, I just wanted to ask.
we just keep this on the agenda. I don't even know that Guilford, I don't want to take Guilford's time next meeting if we don't have to, but just for us to discuss next steps. I, I think so. Uh, I think uh, that our plan for the next meeting was we were going to meet with the uh, community participation uh, officers, but uh, and talk about outreach. But I, I was thinking that this needs to go back on the agenda for our discussion purposes. And I'll just note that I uh, do the uh, take my uh, trash to the transfer station and uh, we have backyard composting. And uh, so we don't have the compost problem in the house because it goes straight into the uh, bin in the backyard. We've never had a bear problem, but I've always been concerned that it might happen. Uh, we certainly uh, find that with recycling, uh, that we also can very much limit our trash pickup. Uh, we have three sets of minutes, February 1st, February 15th, and March 14. I had one question about March 14. Does anybody have any questions about uh, or um, changes that they want to propose on March 1st or uh, on February 1st to February 15? Uh, I have one question for uh, George. Uh, in the uh, one, the, the March 14th minutes uh, where we're talking about uh, the college, Amherst College sign, you said um, you're quoted in there saying, Ryan stated that he is not concerned with the amount of signage at the corner, but was con but that was a concern raised by committee members. And my recollection was it wasn't a member of the committee, it was other counselors when we discussed it. And so the, the only change that I came up with out of all three minutes was to change the words uh, committee members to counselors. I have no objection. That, that was what I was trying to say. I was reporting what a counselor had raised as a concern. It was one counselor. Uh, that's my memory. Yes, is one. It may have been more, but at least one. Yeah, I think then it was two. Uh, Jennifer said two, so uh, then we could leave. I think it one had a concern about safety, and the other just visual. But it was two that during the meeting that raised. So um, that's the propose that that's the change I would propose is to put in counselors instead of committee members. Uh, Bob? Yeah, under uh, the North Pleasant Street pedestrian improvements, um, I did raise the issue of raising uh, the crosswalks, and Guilford gave the same answer he gave today, which was that's an emergency route. Uh, you know, emergency vehicles travel there, so they don't want to use that. But I think the, meeting, the minute notes should uh, reflect that. So... Well, let's see which uh, minutes are we on now. This is the the fourteenth. Uh, it's under three North Pleasant Street improvements. It's on the second page. Um, there's a whole bunch of comments in there, and then but that isn't in there. And I I specifically did raise that issue or ask about that issue. So do you have a specific language that Athena that you can give to Athena? Is that... Yeah, I could say something like, uh, you know, Hegner um, asked about raised crosswalks, uh, crosswalks, and uh, Mr. Mooring noted that the policy is not to put uh, speed bumps on through routes or routes that are used by uh, emergency vehicles. And uh, Councilor Lord, um, will we be voting on all three of these as one? And if so, do I need to abstain since I missed the March fourteenth meeting? Okay, I can. We can take them. Uh, take February first, fifteenth separately, because actually, um, what the motion would be, and, uh, and Athena, did you have a question before I get to motion? Um. 
to answer Councillor Lord's question, um, you you can vote on minutes when you weren't a participant at the meeting, um, but if you want to take them up separately so that you can abstain or or whatever for um, meetings that you weren't present, that's fine. And I would just ask that members who have changes to minutes, please send me the wording because I don't think I'm capturing um, okay. all of the exact language. I'd appreciate that. Thank you. I'll do that, Athena. Okay, and I, uh, that's pretty easy, but I can do that too. Uh, so why don't we take it as two separate motions? Let's just vote on them because it'll go quick with the small number of members committee. And then I think that uh, we're probably ready to adjourn. Uh, so I'm gonna move to adopt the, uh, to accept the minutes uh, for February 1st and February 15, 2024 as presented. Second. There's a motion made and seconded. Uh, so uh, we'll start with uh, Councillor Lord. Lord, I. And uh, Councillor Hegner. I. And uh, Councillor Ryan. I. And I'm an I and Councillor Taub. I. So it's unanimous. And then the second uh, is to adapt, accept the minutes of March uh, 14, 2024 as amended. Second. So motion made and seconded. Uh, just real quickly, uh, Bob Hegner. Aye. And uh, Councilor Lord. Lord, aye. Uh, and Councilor Ryan. Aye. Yeah, I'm an aye. And Councilor Tab. Aye. Okay, so um, we have two separate motions. We've taken care of all of the minutes. Is there anything else we need to do? I don't think so, but um, I think our new practice is somebody needs to make a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. <laughs> okay, motion made and seconded. And Council Lord. Lord, I. Uh, Councilor Hegner. I. Councilor Ryan. I. I'm an I and Council Tab. I. It's unanimous. We are adjourned. Thank you very Thank much. You. Yeah. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Thank you, Gilford. Thank you.